it. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today, uh, members of Latinos in Clinical Research, and for those of you that are tuning in later on. Um, so today's career series is uh, section number one. Uh, I did mention before we were going to do three uh, series of this, three sections of this, but we, we've talked and we realized that it can be jumbled up into two, right? So uh, we go ahead, we're going ahead and have this one today, as well as the next one that's going to be on the June the 22nd, the same time. This one will be with... Um, Dan Sparrow, because he wasn't able to be with us today. And it will be also with Lindsay. I can never pronounce her last name. Do you, you all know how to pronounce Lindsay's last name? Because I want to make sure I say it right. <laughs> if not, no worries. Well, either way, we'll be put, putting her photo and her bio on, on the poster. But she is uh, pretty huge in the recruiting industry. Um, I know that she looks over a few tens of thousands of recruiters. So she's pretty major. And she focuses in biotech, uh, pharmaceuticals, and I believe also in clinical research, right? But all those kind of intertwine a bit. So um, she will be speaking at the next one. So today, though, we have uh, me, uh, Judy Galindo, Monica Cuitiva. We have uh, Chris Falber, and we have, uh, uh, do you want to, uh, Monica, do you want to introduce our guest? Yes, we have a special guest. Uh, Ken, he has experience in the recruiting industry, the recruitment industry, so he's going to share with us tips and information also. He is also, um, has been in the, um, in, in, I mean, with, with the industry and research industry in different parts of it, um, especially in the marketing uh, uh, area now with DocuSign too. Awesome. Uh, so we're going to be uh, I mean, his, his input is very interesting because he also uh, has uh, uh, managerial uh, positions in the past, so he knows what he's looking for, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today, Ken. I don't know if you wanted to say something. <laughs> no, I just, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And, uh, oops, sorry. I'm sitting outside at my daughter's house right now because they're putting the baby down. So if it gets yeah. noisy out here or hear too many birds, I'll, I'll try and go back inside. <laughs> no um, worries, love birds. I'm in uh, Cincinnati. Oh, okay, so, awesome, uh, awesome. Yeah, just short Thank notice, you. but if, uh, there, I was in the uh, executive recruiting business. Now it's, it's over 10 years now, but uh, we had some good points that we used to talk to people about on uh, resume writing. Uh, cover letter writing and maybe some questions you might want to ask in an interview. So I will contribute those at the appropriate time. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, just to give you a little introduction uh, on me, Monica and Judy, so that you kind of have a little bit of our background now that Ken has provided his. Um, so aside from, you know, being an RSM2 with a global CRO um, and being a, a co-founder for the Latinos in Clinical Research and the Clinical Research Circle, um, I have my own business called the AM Approach. Um, literally, you know, the Ashley Margo Approach is because I, uh, I took all my experiences in the clinical industry for the past 10, 11 years and uh, everything that I utilized to pretty much get the jobs that I wanted to get and get them in a very fast pace, right? And so um, through this, I've assisted many individuals that are fresh new in the industry of research and in the clinical industry, as well as, you know, uh, physicians coming from... Um, you know, international countries and things like that. So it really broad expansion. So I'm gonna bring some of that information here today and share that with you all. Um, Monica, do you wanna give a little bit of your background? Yes, sure. <laughs> so my name is Monica Cuitiva. Uh, I am uh, one of the co-founders of Latinos in Clinical Research, the CRC Academy, and also uh, the Clinical Research Circle. I am part also of a clinic, uh, site direct, director of a clinic, and, uh, and I also have a lot of experience, I mean, in the industry and in the past, not just in the United States, but in also in different other countries. So I think, um, I mean, all over the, 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 the world, we basically experience the same uh, situations of the same challenges when we are applying for new jobs. And, and for those out there that are uh, immigrants or immigrants coming from different countries and you're, you have a, a little bit of fear applying or um, some um, maybe things that have more challenges, 
don't worry about it. Actually, now diversity is 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 in every single industry, especially in clinical trials. Uh, I mean, in the clinical research industry. So bringing diversity in in the industry is actually wonderful. So um, is 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 uh, probably a plus right now. Putting in your CV that you speak a different language, that you come from other country. That's that's uh, that's amazing because, like I say, right now that's uh, bringing diversity in the workforce, and basically every company out there is looking for that. So uh, instead of being um, um, uh, how you say uh, a weakness, it's a strength. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Monica and Judy. Um, yes. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm a director of research for Sun Valley Research Center, also co-owner of a small research center and co-founder of Latinos in Clinical Research. And I think I can actually provide some helpful tips because I do hire all the staff for research. I'm also I also assist with um, interviewing sometimes providers for our PI's private clinic, which actually we're in transition right now, hiring a nurse practitioner or PA or psychiatrist. And so I work well with the administrator of that office, and we're going to actually start interviewing a few candidates so um and we are also bringing on interns at a research center or we have this year and so there's a lot of things that i think i can give feedback on things that uh, when people reach out to me that they did not include that i told them you know i respond to them and tell them they should include um and things that i think you don't realize that your prior experiences whether it's in school and other jobs and things you did even if um, you know in a small setting um, that you should put on your resume because that shows you're part of a group or a project or maybe you have um, experience administering questionnaires or something to that effect. Um, and a lot of people don't include that information on the resume or CV. So hopefully I can give you feedback as uh, an employer. <laughs> awesome, well, thank you all for being here today. Um, so please take some notes, uh, just a reminder you know, it's a, a regular webinar, right? So it's not super, super lengthy. So we are going to be kind of doing some surface uh, reviewing of, of these three different sections, which is resume, LinkedIn, and interviewing skills. Um, we will give you an opportunity to ask questions. Um, and so just to keep that in mind, right? So first things first, uh, the resume. Uh, so before I get started on the layout that we're having, I actually wanted to, to ask how, and we, we as you know, LSR, we, we talked about it, we felt that it would be good to ask, is there anything specific that you would prefer us to cover before we go through our specific layout? Anything that you prefer, uh, personally have had experience and issues with that you feel that you're not as strong in, just so that we can make sure we're giving the opportunity to actually deal with y'all specific issues with this, this area. Any questions? So we, we are open to questions right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can you can share with us the challenges and or or what will be the uh, a topic that you would like us to discuss today. Yeah, or you could put it in the chat if you don't want to say yeah. it. Um, but yeah. don't be afraid; it's okay. Any yes. question, we want to help you um, succeed. <laughs> yeah. So um, while I guess we're waiting, um, I guess I'll get started. So for the basics, right? Um, you know, like I said, with my company, the AM approach. Um, I, I assist a lot with resumes. And one of the most common issues that I see right off the bat is templates, right? Uh, the template layout, uh, you'll have uh, scenarios where you know individuals um, literally will just look like they're typing it out, like just layering it in. And this is from all levels, entry and from individuals that have five to seven years experience, right? So it's pretty, it's pretty exceptional. But yes, that's a big, big error. What I always suggest for those that are not good in formatting, obviously look it up on YouTube, right? There's very simple ways of doing things. Uh, it's pretty basic, but if that's something you're not necessarily good at, what I always suggest is having your resume, laying out all the job scenes, all the job descriptions, everything that you know that you're gonna be putting in on your resume. And then once you have it laid out well, then at this point, you want to go into Word document, right? And you want to pick out a template. Now, I actually, I'm going to share my screen just so that we can, oops. Monica, can you let me share my screen real quick? Because I just want to show sure. an example. Um, actually, we have two questions. Okay. Oh, okay. Let me just yeah, show this chat. one and then we'll jump yeah. into the questions okay. right away. Let me see, how can I let you share? <laughs> no worries. Okay, right here. Uh, okay, I awesome. make you a co uh, a host. Okay, all right. 
Okay, awesome. Let me go ahead and pick this up. One moment. Do you want me to read the questions in the meantime? Okay. Uh, I have it right here. So can okay. y'all see my screen? Yes. Word. Okay, awesome. So it's the word background, correct? Just want to make sure y'all can see that. We see the Zoom. The Zoom? Okay. Yeah, I see the Zoom. Yeah. Okay, let me share, share screen again. Let's do Word, okay, here. All right, here, this is where you go into home when you're on the Word document, all right? So the first things first is once again, like I said, whenever you are already done typing out everything that you're gonna have on your resume, you can come here to more templates. You go to home, you're gonna showcase this, all your previous stuff. You're gonna go to more templates. It also depends on which uh, version of Word you have, but all of Word versions have this. Um, I have the most recent one, so this might not be the exact layout, but still just kind of look around and you'll find it. And you'll see right here, you'll have all sorts of different types of templates, but in this situation, we want resumes and cover letters, right? And so you're gonna come here and you're gonna see all sorts of templates. Now, you don't have to just focus on these, right? There's a lot of websites online that have free templates. And I always state you know, that it's good to kind of let your personality show on your resumes, just so long as it doesn't look, you don't have any, uh, face photos that's not really it's kind of frowned upon a little bit um you know and and there's not like multiple columns or anything like that i mean i'm personally not a full fan of columns but i think something you know to this this extent is okay um when you are doing this though um what i have my clients do i always make sure that they have a resume as well as the cover letter and so when that happens obviously you're going to want to make sure you you pick up the, the resume version and you also pick up the cover letter version. And why? Because you want there to be uniformity across so that there's professionalism. It looks nice. It looks very clean. Um, and, you know, at that point, once you have it, the template is already there for you. All you have to do is go in, type everything out. I'm going to stop sharing now. All you have to do is go in and type everything out and uh, make sure that the, the font is good, that everything's kind of situated the way that, you know, you would like it to look. Let me go ahead and fix this one moment. Hold on. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead, jump to those questions real quick before I continue to move on. Uh, should a resume for entry level research jobs from an experienced candidate be one page or two pages? It, I, I personally say it's always good to have two pages. I mean, if you only have enough information for one page, that's fine. Uh, in situations like that, I always tell my clients, so we'll go find certificates online, right? Go look at individuals, professionals on LinkedIn, anywhere that you can find them, review their profiles, see how you can mold yourself to them. Look at the certificates that they've had. Look at the different trainings they had. You can go to Coursera.com, take those classes for free. You can go you know, to cityprogram.com or .org. Uh, you can go to ACRP, SOPRA, look at their, you know, uh, certifications online, uh, look to get involved with organizations and start layering that information in there, right? There's so many ways that you can go about lengthening your resume or also shortening it, of course. Um, but in this situation, I would always suggest two pages. Um, Monica, Ken, Judy, do you have any other uh, input for that? No, I think you, you said everything. To, yeah. I agree. I agree. <laughs> awesome. Okay, great. Well, next question. Uh, I'm a foreign medical doctor and trying to get an entry level job in clinical research. Uh, I have had three to four interviews for jobs, but I don't have any job offers yet. I have no clinical research experience in the US and I live in North Carolina. Uh, what should I do to get an entry level job in clinical research? Um, Judy, Monica, I don't know if y'all want to kind of jump in first and then I kind of give my input after? Um, so I guess it, I would ask if you've completed any trainings online for research, just to get more familiar with the research industry, like GCP training, good clinical practice, any of those other free ones you can get online. So you can add that to your CV um, because there's a bunch of free stuff online you can do and quick um, trainings, um, even depending where you're going into what therapeutic area, or if there's a way you can maybe, since you are a foreign medical doctor, a lot of times you can also be a rater for studies, depending on what background you have. So you can even do like the CSSRS training online for free, um, and things like that. So I guess I would need more information to kind of guide you in which way to go, but the more training you can get and add it to your CV that might help you um, 
get more interviews and possibly a job offer. It just also depends what type of entry level job you're looking to go into. Yeah, you can also offer uh, volunteering time, uh, mm -hmm. like probably screening patients since you have already the medical background, you will be able to, to understand the inclusion and exclusion criteria probably better than um, than uh, and other people volunteering. So you have a good background. Uh, you could offer uh, that volunteering time uh, to start with, so that way you can start building your experience. And another way, um, a quicker way, probably will be also join uh, the CRC Academy. But if you have interest on in that, uh, reach out to me. And uh, and obviously, there are other ways that you can also get more experience, like, for example, uh, doing recruitment, patient recruitment is another way that you could also uh, put your fit in, 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 in this industry. Um, in any, any clinic, I assure you that any clinic, if you offer your volunteering time to, recruiting, uh, to recruit patients, um, more likely, they are going to say yes, <laughs> because that's one of the parts that most of the clinics have challenges in. Um, the other one will be also looking for studies. Um, um, and, and, and actually, using the clinicaltrials.gov, the website, many of, this, uh, many of these studies have the list of all the sites located in the United States that are carrying out that study. So if you have any particular uh, uh, therapeutic area of interest, look for that specific uh, therapeutic, uh, um, I mean, um, area or the conditions that belongs to that therapeutic area and look for the clinics that have that and start applying to that. And, and obviously, like I say, you can also offer uh, volunteering time or um, and, and, and they will be probably open to give you that opportunity. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Monica, because I actually, um, one of my clientele, he was uh, an international uh, medical doctor, foreign medical doctor, and uh, what he ended up doing, he uh, was a translator for a hospital, so that's kind of how he got his foot in the door into the clinical industry here, um, and then through that hospital, there's a lot of, uh, you know, hospitals that do a lot of research, so he looked for the research department, and he offered uh, his volunteering experience, right, and so of uh, they took him up for that offer and they utilized him in recruitment. The way he went about it though, is he spoke directly with, um, he spoke directly with the, the main PI, the physician that was running the research, uh, explained to him a situation and, and how he wanted to be in research and, and all of that good stuff. And so um, obviously very strong communication, right? But you, you need to get your foot in the door. So uh, I also like that route, you know, because me personally, that's kind of how I made my way into research. Um, so you can definitely do that if you, if you, even though if you're not a certified interpreter, there's some hospitals that, you know, given the fact that you're a, 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 pre, a, a medical doctor and you also know a foreign language and you were practicing in a, in a foreign country, um, there's, there's things I'm sure that they'd be willing to do. There's some uh, organizations that are willing to um, pay for your training. I know that one of the hospitals that I worked for they were paying for the translating training. So lots of different options, lots of different ways to maneuver. It's just finding out who, what, and where, right? So I would highly suggest if, you know, the CRC Academy is not something you can do at the moment. And if, you know, you don't necessarily have the funds to do these other trainings, or you want to do the trainings on top of that, you also want to put your foot in the door, highly suggest that you start calling up hospitals and asking them if there's, um, you know, translating opportunities and stuff like that, because I'm sure there is this diversity is becoming, I mean, it's, it's always been here, it's, it's huge, but now they're paying way much more attention to this. So you can use this uh, to your advantage, obviously, right? And, and definitely try to find a way in. Um, actually, somebody's asking, would they, uh, actually, Andrea is asking, would the reference website be noted, like CT and the other ones mentioned? Uh, noted, uh, what do you mean, like uh, later in the recording? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, 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 some, uh, Andrea is asking if she should. Uh, I mean, if the if in the in the CV. The, oh uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So sorry, sorry. Yes, yes. In the CV, most definitely all certifications. Um, and that's kind of another thing. You know, we we're going to come to is that certifications are. You know, your education is a huge deal, right? Because it's kind of like 
well, that's, if that's going to be the gateway in the door, even though I personally don't agree with it, um, you know, obviously you want to showcase your education, but I think the most strongest things to showcase are your certifications and your skill set strengths, right? Because even sometimes at that point, you don't, people don't display it well enough or in more with enough description in their job descriptions, yeah. right? So uh, I feel that those are the most important aspects to really kind of focus and hone in on. Um, I don't know, Ken or Judy, do y'all have any insight in that? Or Monica? <laughs> I, I will actually like to add something that uh, uh, remember that when you're showing your CV that you're investing, even if it's not money, but you're investing time in educating yourself, whether it is like taking the CT class or doing the GCTs or taking the IATA or doing the NIH, you're showing that you're already investing in your uh, career, like you're, you're taking the time to take these classes. So you're showing that you are truly interested in this because remember that a lot of these companies sometimes um, don't hire people that don't have experience because, or don't give them the opportunity because they think that uh, probably when they go in the training after two months, they're going to say, you know what? I didn't like this, thank you very much, goodbye. So that's a waste of time and money for them. Well, if you show in your CV that you already are investing time uh, in any of these classes and you're educating, you're taking the time to educate yourself so you already know what it is to be part of this industry somehow, that's, that's a plus in your CV. Right. Um, <clears throat> Ashley, what I can contribute is um, basically <clears throat> some content on the various steps on finding a job. I don't know if you want me to do that at the end or, or uh, interject now, or what would you like to do? Oh, uh, well, we could do that now if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. So um, my background is also very large companies like Citibank and Dun & Bradstreet. Uh, I've worked all over the world as well. I lived in Asia for 10 years. And I worked for a, an executive recruiting firm uh, for about four or five years. And uh, the first step, obviously, is, is your resume. And I want to give you some practical tips of all the resumes I've seen. And people still send me resumes to look at and, and help them out. So the, the biggest mistake I usually see on a resume, and, and I agree with Ashley, I'm formatting and all of that's fine. But it's the content that's going to either uh, get you to the next step or not. And what I see on a lot of resumes are job descriptions rather than accomplishments. Okay, for example, uh, somebody says, uh, you know, sales manager. And then under, the, under that title with bullet points, it says things like manage the sales force, reported uh, quarterly earnings responsible for uh, revenue over three months, uh, and hiring and firing people. I don't know anything about what this guy can do or not do. All that is is a job description for a sales manager. What I'm interested in is, for example, uh, when he puts down the company, a lot of people put a company in just maybe a link. It's easier for me, the reader, by the way, I've just looked at 25 resumes and they all say they're great. So the easier the resume is for me to get through and get to the facts quickly, the better before yours ends up in a circular file. So if it says, you know, uh, Acme Precision Company, uh, maybe it's just a couple more, uh, another sentence or a few words that tells me what that is. Uh, $200 million manufacturing company uh, of uh, chairs and tables, whatever it is. Give me an idea of, of what this company is that you are working for or have worked for. Otherwise, I got to look it up if I want to bother because I'm already busy. Uh, then I would like to know, uh, did you have anybody reporting to you? So let a team of four people, something like that. Then I know that maybe you've got some management experience. And then I want to know if you got anything done. You know, if it, depending on the level you're going in, uh, there's two things I'm interested in, uh, increasing my revenue or decreasing my expenses. Did you have anything to do with any of that? So it doesn't mean you had to have led a sales team. Maybe you uh, found out uh, a, a much more efficient way to do a certain process, whether it's in clinical testing or anything else, that saved your company money. Uh, maybe uh, you came up with a, a new uh, uh, 
uh, idea or strategy that brought in some new customers. Um, maybe you were responsible for hiring four new people who are still with the company. What have you done for the company? Okay, uh, and if you haven't done a lot, that's okay. Just then you, you resort a little bit to uh, more job descriptions, but also you've got in your, your traits. If you're just starting out, it's things like, you know, I wanna know if somebody's a hard worker. I wanna know if somebody's a team player. Uh, and not just I'm good with people, I highly recommend you don't have that anywhere because <laughs> everybody's good with people, all right? So on your resume, make sure you put down your accomplishments, uh, not your job description. Give me a little idea of the size of that company you were working for and what they did. Give me an, an idea of the team that maybe you worked on, uh, worked on XYZ team, we were responsible for whatever you guys were responsible for. Now I'm getting a picture of what you actually did there rather than just a job description. Um, and yeah, and your title obviously in there as well. Anybody have any questions on any of that quickly? Oh, there's one question. Uh, what, are the what are the facts you are looking for? Which I, I think you already pretty much gave that. Yeah, it has to do with, uh, again, think of it as, did I help the company increase the revenue? Did I help them run something smooth, more smoothly? Did I help them decrease expenses? How did I contribute to the success of that company? That's what I'm kind of interested in. Again, it depends on your level. If you're just an entry level, maybe you haven't done a whole lot of that yet. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, they're also asking accomplishments in academics uh, counts as well? Uh, yes, uh, ac academics count, yes. Um, if you got an 800 on your biology SAT2 in high school, I would like to know that. That means you're a pretty smart cookie. Yeah. Uh, if you uh, got, you know, were some sort of a scholar or, or went to school on a scholarship or worked your way through school, you know, with a part time job, that helps me understand who you are and that you work hard. Okay. And my question for you would actually be uh, in the situation where you have an individual who has a really long resume and has all of that along with a lot of good job descriptions, what would, what would take precedence more? Would it would you suggest getting rid of old job descriptions that are that are good and leaving good academic accomplishments available to see? Or well, I'm you? I'm. It depends on what job you're applying for. If it's if it's something that's a more academic, you're going to be in the research side or something like that. Then you know, let's keep the academics in there, especially if they're relevant. If you're a frontline person, uh, I want to know what you've done on the front line. So I would say that. In, in terms of how far you go back, you know, I can go back 40 years. You guys <laughs> can't go back that far. But, you know, after about 10 years, unless it's something really relevant, uh, you might list the, just the, the company and the title. And that way, if they're interested, when they look at your resume, they can ask you about it. But, you know, what you did 12 and 14 years ago, maybe not so relevant. Uh, the last five years, obviously, yes. And even the last 10 years. And, and if, you were, if you're showing longevity with a company, nowadays, I know that's changing a lot. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if I see that you've taken a new job every year or two, you know, I'll question it in my head uh, versus somebody who's shown uh, consistent accomplishments over in one company over, let's say, eight years or something like that. Now, I know today's market, a lot of people jump around a lot more and we take that into consideration. But still, give me somebody who's steady and shown how they contributed to the company. And I want to talk to that person. Yeah, for sure. Okay. That's super great. Thank you so much. And, and this part, you guys, this is a perfect example as to how, um, you know, depending on what jobs you're applying for and then what the focus of that job is, right? Because um, you might be applying for a CRC uh, position with a, a university, but more on the academic side, but then you might be CRC within CRO sponsor that is really looking more for operational background, right? You're going to be having to tweak mm -hmm. and pull your resume accordingly for all of these jobs, it's not just one and done. You're always gonna be adjusting. So just, you know, always be mm. thoughtful about the positions you're applying to and don't just be in a rush to push them out because, you know, it's quality over quantity, or at least that's how I feel, right? Uh, if you provide quality and you're very thoughtful with the jobs that you're applying to and you know they're linking with, they're, they're meshing with what you're wanting and you're actually in sync with what the job is trying, with the company, what their, you know, their, their vision, their mission and all that good stuff, more specifically, if you want longevity, like Ken was talking about, you know, you want to be thoughtful about how you're going to be go, uh, applying to these positions. Uh, Monica or Judy, did y'all have anything else y'all wanted to add before I move on? Uh, uh, we have two questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so one is, 
Shafal, is asking, does increased recruitment rate count? And I answer 100% yes, just because especially recruitment is a challenging uh, part of uh, uh, the industry. So it shows that you're great at overcoming challenges to begin with, and also helping any, uh, whether it is at the CRO level, a sponsor level, site level, everybody wants more, pa more patients. So if you're great at recruitment, that's, that's something really good to show in your CV. Um, I don't know if anybody would like to add anything else to this. I do um, have another question. Yeah. yeah, go ahead if you want to ask, and then I wanted to add something. OK, for sure. How would you go about including transferable skills? Can, uh, would you include a separate section or include them in individual job descriptions? Well, again, that's, that's, uh, I've seen different formats. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I prefer a chronological format that takes me through uh, what they've done, but sometimes there's bullet points in the beginning or in that opening uh, couple of sentences, it talks about what your particular strengths are and skill sets. So that might be bullet points, um, you know, um, uh, particularly good at um, uh, working on a team, uh, you know, it's wording that differently. But I want to see if you're if you've been on teams and you're effective uh, working with a team, that's that's extremely important. Depending on the on the environment that you're going to be working in, uh, if you um, tend to um, stay with the job until it's over, uh, detail oriented, um, uh, strategic thinker kind of thing but you got to be able to back this up you just can't put strategic thinker and then when i get you in the interview i said well tell me about <laughs> some strategic thinking you've done you know so if you but if you have been involved with strategy if you have been involved with um planning um uh, uh various future for the company and uh, that you were sitting at the table when some decisions were made uh, those kinds of things are okay in bullet points that, but if you don't put them there and I see them in your in your actual job descriptions, that's absolutely fine. Depends on the format you use. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ken. And I guess uh, since we've already kind of covered a good amount for the resume and we still have these yeah. two other sections, I do want to add one more thing. Uh, lastly would be, um, you know, grammar. And I know for some for some in recruitment, it's not as as you know, big, I, uh, but I will say that if you're going into site level or if you're going into maybe through a hospital, there are individuals, and I've worked with them before, um, that are very meticulous with hiring certain individuals that don't have like fine grammar on the resume or especially on their cover letter, right? Because it's more of a like okay. story format, right? So, so you know, um, if you're not great at that, I highly suggest looking up Grammarly, Grammarly.com. It assists, it's kind of like a download. It assists you as you're typing information out. I mean, again, because, you know, not all of us have individuals that are available 24-7 to kind of uh, look over our stuff for us so if you if you are in that situation please look up grammarly.com I, I i find it very useful and um yeah so uh now the way, if, if if i see a typo or two on a resume that's almost an automatic knockout knockout same okay. on the cover letter proof it three or four times have somebody else read it over please because if you're going to make mistakes on your resume you're going to make mistakes working for me yeah Exactly. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> awesome. Well, okay. So now I, I would uh, like to add something. Please. Yeah, go for Monica. yeah. If and especially this industry that everything is attention to detail. If you if they see that you're not attention to detail in your resume, <laughs> that's a lot. Exactly right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, for and sure. I, I wanted. To I want to add something, but I'm not sure if it's going to be on the agenda I was looking. Um, what about when you reach out for a job? Are we going to talk about that? I wanted to mention a few things. When you're contacting someone by email and you're sending your resume, there's a lot of things that, or some things people should consider. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we can bring that up now, definitely, because yeah. I mean, we're going to cover LinkedIn next, so go for it. We can, that'll be a good segue. Yeah, I think the reason I brought it up, because I'm getting a few resumes recently and sometimes I'll just get an email with a resume attached with nothing in the memo or nothing in the description about the person. Um, I really do recommend when you reach out for a job internship that you give a short description about yourself, what your background is, what you're looking for and why you're interested in either working for that company or if you're looking 
to in turn why you're interested and that you know something about that company that you did your research just something short it doesn't have to be a full long email um, because i think that's one of my pet peeves when i get resumes and nobody took the time to put any of that information there and i don't know what i'm getting i don't know about the person so actually that goes to the bottom of my list very right. good advice and I've, I've got a few things on the cover letter also. Um, the first one is, is uh, just what Judy said. Do your homework before you write anything down. Look up articles, find out who the president is. If there's something about how the company's been doing, if there's no articles about them, go to their website. Maybe there's a blog, maybe there's a white paper, something there that, sh and you reference that in your letter. Uh, I was particularly interested to find that you're now going into cancer research. Uh, I think this would fit well with my background because blah, 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 blah. Something along those lines that they know. Uh, I see that um, you, you've had impressive growth over the last two years and I would love to find out more about that. Things like that, that shows, uh, just as Judy said, that you've done a little research that you're not just sending out 500 resumes to whoever's there. Um, the other thing on the resume, um, I've got a, a great line, I think, at the end of your resume or end, end of your cover letter that um, uh, has worked for several people, at least to get them to the next level without seeming too arrogant. Everybody says, so I think I'd be a great fit for your company, blah, 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 blah. I think the real question is, uh, if you think after reviewing my background that someone with my skill sets and experience could be a, a future leader for your company, be an early contributor to your success, then I would love to pursue the matter. Okay, don't tell them that you're gonna be great yet. Just say, if you think after reviewing my background that you, could, you think I could be a future leader for your company, or do you think after, after reviewing my background, if you think someone with my skill sets and experience uh, could be an early contributor to the success of your company, I would love to talk to you further. Something along those lines is what I would recommend. That's really great, thank you, that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I have something to, to mention. I don't know if everybody agree with me with this, but in my case, it's important. <laughs> and I think uh, when people don't have manners just to, to do the greeting uh, in the email or the message, I received in the past a message like, hey, I'm looking for a job, this is my CV. That's it. Uh, uh, for me, that's, 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 that's kind of like, wow, I'm getting here. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I think uh, being polite and, and do your, your, I mean, show your manners is always great and never, and, and, and it's actually showing uh, part of your personality too and how you will be um, approaching a professional and, and even not just a professional, anybody. Yeah, and that's a perfect segue back into what Judy was saying about the email, right? Like it's a, you're being formal. Um, it's super important to be formal and also get, get out of the habit of asking for things. Like you're not, you're there, you want a job and you want a job because you want to give to the company so that there's a, you know, symbiotic uh, give and take, right? Once you're with the actual company, you want to say, hey, how can I uh, offer assistance if, if there's no job openings? Is there a way that I can be of help to your company just so that I can get exposure and get to know what y'all are doing? I really like X, Y, Z, right? You know, the way you approach it can really make a difference compared to the last five, 10 individuals that emailed saying what money got just said, right? Like, oh, here's my resume. You know, can you find me a job, right? Um, can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? I mean, I constantly, and I know money got due to the same and uh, I know I'm pretty sure Chris, if he was uh, on LinkedIn as much, um, you know, we're always getting emails of, can you help me with this? Can you give me this? Can you give me that? And it's like, okay, well, first, uh, you know, introduce yourself, um, mention how I guess you came across our information, what's worked for you, what hasn't worked for you. Like, you know, at least try to make some sort of conversation because when you don't, it's just, you know, it's a quick turn off where it's like, you know, no, right? Like, yeah. And so that, and, and for me, when I've reached out to recruiters or I've reached out to um, individuals via email, I always do that kind of what, uh, you know, Judy had mentioned giving the quick intro. Uh, also making sure I have an electronic signature. If you do not have one, make one. Um, this is actually how I use DocuSign. Uh, I use DocuSign. I create my own DocuSign. And um, whenever I do my cover letter, I have my signature done through DocuSign on the bottom because I prefer that over text. I feel it's more formal. Um, it's also showcasing that I know how to use that system particularly. 
And, you know, I just think it's, it's that next level going that much more above and beyond compared to the other person, right? Because ultimately when you are going up, going up against multiple applicants, those little things, those small little things are what is going to push you further ahead to get you into that interview. So the more that you can line up, the better, right? Um, so with what Judy said, the uh, introduction in the email, making sure there's good grammar, you're, you're being you know, uh, very formal and uh, you're linking yourself with the company and you're explaining why it is that you're reaching out um, and also how it is that you can help, right? Or what it is that you're specifically looking for. And then again, the, the electronic signature, right? So if you wanna put your name, uh, your email, anything that you're associated with. So if you're a member or a chapter member of ACRP or SOCRA, that's always good because you don't know if that other individual on the other side is also part of that organization, right? Or if you put Latinos in clinical research that you're a member, they're gonna show that you have initiative within research and your initiative within diversity and inclusion. That says a lot about you in one word. If I saw that an individual, I would say, oh, there's a lot of humanitarianism in background. I'm, I'm interested in that and might even spark a conversation, right? Or they might say, hey, you know, uh, well, maybe we could actually use you in recruiting because, you know, we're trying to focus on the Latino uh, population, right? Or um, how is it that you can help? There's a lot of things that can create conversation if you just make sure that you do what you can to really provide all the, all the extra information that you can in, in a very formal manner. Um, I don't know, Monica, do you have anything else to add to that before I move on? No, you said it. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. So let's segue into the LinkedIn. Um, so uh, when I had mentioned, when I asked Ken about, you know, when you have already two pages and you don't know how much more to, uh, to have or to remove and things like that, uh, when you're at the point, I feel two pages is the max. I mean, it, it varies from person to person. Uh, just because, again, it's like Ken said, you know, uh, your, your recruiters are looking through many uh, pages, you want to really make sure that you get everything you can very short, sweet, and concise. Um, so I think two pages is the max. Anything extra outside of that, you can put on your LinkedIn, right? And uh, like old job postings, um, if you are applying to more of an operational position within research and you have extra academic background, then, you know, make sure that that's on LinkedIn. LinkedIn can literally have everything, right? But this is the difference between what you're going to be showcasing on your resume compared to what's on LinkedIn. So don't, uh, I always have clients that are always worried like, oh, well, if I don't have everything on there, how are they going to know? And it's like, well, it's your job to provide your LinkedIn URL on your resume, one, uh, to have a very, very good, well-written out LinkedIn profile. Um, not very skimp, because if you have a skimp one, then don't even direct them to you, because again, you want them to know more about you, not just give very small detail. Um, and then three, you know, being able to, uh, have all your extra information there. And, and when you're in your interview, like I, when I, what I do in my interview, I always make sure to really hit in reminding them if they want to know any extra information about me um, that we can't cover in our interview today, please go look at my LinkedIn. Um, I feel that there's a lot of valuable information about me that would really help you make a, a more mm -hmm. concise decision on me. Right. And so, you know, that's one of the major reasons why I think LinkedIn is a very, very uh, important because you can't really have everything on your resume, especially if you're very active or if you have a lot of job backgrounds and all of that. Um, another thing for LinkedIn, it's uh, you want to use the full profile because uh, when you're utilizing the pro full profile and you're inputting, you know, all the strength words and making sure that you're you're showcasing that you're going into research and you're linking with Latinos and clinical research, and ACRP, and all these other organizations that are already niched into research the algorithm on LinkedIn is already gonna start niching you without you even realizing it. And it starts to hone into your network. And then your network gets built off of these platforms, right? So you can already start finding individuals within your area or region just through your network that it creates for you. So um, again, networking is the whole reason why you're here in Latino, Latinos and Clinical Research. Um, we're here providing free resources for you. There's a bunch of these things on LinkedIn and there's a bunch of individuals that provide useful information on a daily through their posts. Recruiters, head recruiters, um, just individuals that are heavily involved in the industry. Um, and then us, you know, we're posting our information. So don't underestimate the use of LinkedIn and what it can really do for you because it can do some really, really amazing things. Um, 
something else I'd like to, to talk on was that you could also use it uh, for professional advantage on professional growth. One thing I tell my clientele is to when you are done with your, your LinkedIn profile and you've already applied to these jobs and it's kind of a waiting game, um, you can start looking at these organizations and say you really want to work for a CRO or a sponsor. You can start researching these companies, look at the individuals that work for them. If your long-term goal is a CTM, go look at a CTM's page and say, okay, what, did, what jobs does she have, he or she have before being a CTM? What levels are that? Can I go towards that? Can that be my path? And how do I get there? Um, is there a way to jump through that? What certs is she taking? What types of strengths does she have listed? Because um, clearly these are the things that that CRO or sponsor is looking at, right? These are the things that really, I guess, hones them into that individual uh, aside from other clear things that were probably, you know, expressed through the interview, right? But um, you can really do yourself a service and, utilize this opportunity through LinkedIn to to do that for yourself because it's we're in a virtual era now right we don't necessarily need to always just have that mentor right next to us right we have resources that are free through here in LICR but as well as online so really utilize it you know you can do many things for yourself it's just how much are you willing to do how much time are you willing to invest and how bad do you really want it? You know, are you just wanting just to get in the industry just to get in? Or do you just really want it and you can't stand the job you were in? That was my situation. I could not really stand the position I was in. I felt like I was not being used to my full potential and I was not where I wanted to be as far as industry. So I literally put a whole month work of extreme work, researching all of this information that we're providing today, um, as well as, you know, on the side, um, you know, it's just, you really have to focus and, and really, you know, work hard for what you want. Because once you get there, that's it. I mean, I think anybody will tell you once you're in the research industry, at that point you're in, you ha you're getting the experience. Now you now it's really just networking and just growing and figuring out where you want to go from there, right? Um, I don't know if um, Monica or Judy or, or Ken or Chris, if y'all want to add anything to that. Um, no, I think I have so, a few things to talk about in the interview itself, whenever you're oh, ready okay. for that. Okay, awesome. Um, I would like to add that, for example, when, uh, I mean, obviously, the, the, your success in any career is, your, is re your responsibility, right? If you don't do the effort that you make looking for a job, it's going to be directly uh, um, uh, reflected in what you're going to get. I mean, if you, if you apply for five jobs and expecting to get five phone calls, that's probably... Mm -hmm. Uh, not going to happen. So you need to make a lot of effort uh, applying to as many companies as you can. And obviously, but like like uh, uh, Ashley was saying, be strategic also in what kind of job you're looking for, but, but make a lot of effort because sitting or waiting uh, to get an answer from five companies is probably uh, going to take a long time yeah. <laughs> unless you keep on following up to the same companies uh, over and over again until they get tired and answer you, <laughs> yeah. which I actually think is a good strategy too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you no, have interest sure. in one particular company, uh, I, I agree a hundred percent. I actually uh, was able to get uh, shadowing hours in the clinical industry by doing that, and she, the PA, and the doctor ended up being really close to me. But they said that. They got so annoyed with me that they finally decided to give me an, an opportunity. And then there you go, <laughs> got in. Um, but anyways, a switching. Um, lastly about LinkedIn, uh, for those of you that use multiple search engines for jobs, a lot of y'all don't know this, but each of those uh, search engines also have a, uh, algorithms that they use. Maybe not as great as LinkedIn, but once you have your full LinkedIn profile, which is the ultimate resume, right? Because it has everything you can add you can add in, you know, courses that you've taken in the past. You can add in different projects that you've done, things that you normally would not put on the resume that are kind of outside of that, you know, um, I guess, space or however you want to put it. Um, you can add that in there because all this extra stuff outside has a lot to do with who you are as an individual. You know, just because, say, you like to volunteer at your local church doesn't mean because it's not work, doesn't mean it doesn't pertain to what kind of a professional individual you would be, right? Because 
that, you know, there's empathy in there, there's volunteering, there's humanitarianism, all that plays really huge into clinical research. It's just, again, using that and selling yourself in the interview and reminding them that these things that you do outside also contribute to who you are professionally, right? So, um, but bringing back to that, you're having the whole, your whole ultimate resume on LinkedIn. All these other search engines allow you the opportunity to link your, your LinkedIn URL profile to their search engines. So instead of having to go through uh, with, you know, monster.com, Indeed, Glassdoor, all these different, you know, search engines, you can just create one big one on LinkedIn and then go to these other, you know, search engines and just link your profile. And then bam, you have a series of, you know, open doors running these different job openings for you because, you know, LinkedIn isn't necessarily utilized by smaller sites uh, in all hospitals, sometimes they use Monster, sometimes they use Indeed and all that stuff, especially local areas, right? So definitely something to consider. Um, if you do not feel very comfortable about your LinkedIn, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I can, you know, run through, run through my services with you if you'd like. It is a lot. LinkedIn is a lot, um, but take your time to go through it. It's, it's so beneficial. It really, really is. Um, and I just can't stress it enough. It was the game changer for me. That's all I can say. For me, it was the game changer. And that's why I, you know, push it so hard because uh, we're in a virtual world now. It's, well, not now, but, you know, it's, we're really pushing that virtual realism that's happening at the moment. And uh, I think LinkedIn is really the place to be. Um, some, oh, actually, uh, Monica, can you mention the clubhouses real quick or put them on the chat? Uh, these are also a great way for you to network, you guys. And I know we're going to be having a career one uh, sometime later this year. So just so you're aware, go to Clubhouse. They have Android now, both iPhone and Android. Um, get that app. Look up uh, the Guru Nation, I think, right? And, um, and yeah, add it. Yeah, we it's have a three. Uh, one on Mondays. Uh, that is called the... Um, Keeping it real. With, Keeping with it real. Our, yeah, then on Wednesdays real. is uh, is uh, like executives or uh, professionals. I, think, I, can't, I can't remember, but they're listed there. They're yeah. listed, I think. And then Friday is a mixer, uh, yeah. Friday night mixer. So in any of those, uh, you get to know more people. You get to speak with more people, experiences, professionals. So you're going to learn a lot, really, just by participating in that. Yes. Highly, highly recommended <laughs> okay you guys so we're getting close to seven o'clock let's let's jump into the interviewing real quick and then we'll we'll take some uh yes clubhouse is available on android now yes just as recently so um all right so for interviewing uh do y'all have any specific questions in regards to the interviewing okay i guess we'll, we'll wait in regards to that. So uh, biggest point in interviewing, strong, strong communication. The way you answer your questions is super important. I do not think that it's, it's the best to just what I call robotic, where interviewer asks you a question, interviewee answers a question, and then back and forth like that, right? I just, I think that you really need to really make conversation. You need to be personable. Um, one, uh, I don't know, Monica, do you have a specific maybe interviewee uh, experience where you've interviewed somebody or Judy or Ken um, that you feel would be kind of a good example to, to bring up right now as far as, you know, good advice on how they should go about interviews? Um, I, I'll tell you what I, I tell people about interviewing. This is not really about you going to get a job, okay? That's not what the person who's talking to you is thinking. What are they thinking? They're wondering if you are a good fit for their company and for this position. If you approach it also that you are wondering if they are a good fit for you, is it the kind of company I want to work for? Then the interview becomes a conversation. And a conversation is much better than question and answer. Okay, so if you go in there saying, I got to get this job, well, that's one way to do it. Or, you know what, I want to see if these guys are any good for me. And you'll actually be in a conversation, we'll be interviewing them as well. 
And it, you will come off with much more confidence and you'll ask a lot of good questions, which makes me think, you know what, this person is thinking through whether this is the right company for them. Also, they're not just giving me a bunch of stuff trying to get the job. Okay, so a couple of quick questions you could ask. One I love, and, and you, you don't just start off with this, but you might, if they say, well, what, what, can, what, can, uh, what can I help you with? You might wanna know something like, well, can you tell me what the ideal candidate for this job would be? Now, why do you ask that question? If they answer it, they're gonna give you all the reasons they're gonna hire somebody. And you, in the back of your mind, are ticking off all the fit that you have with some of those bullet points that they are telling you. And when you get to talk, you want to make sure that now you know what's important to them. If you have something in your background or a skill set that's going to match up with that, I think you want to talk about that, right? You also want to find out more about the company itself. What would you want to know about a company you're going to work for? Are they doing any good? You know, are they going to be around next week? So you might ask a question like, can you tell me a little bit about the last couple of years uh, with the, the health of your business? Uh, and they talk about that a little bit. And you say, well, can you tell me where the growth is going to come from over the next three years, five years, something like that? You're not talking now about the job. You're talking. You're showing them that you're thinking through the company itself. And then another good question you can ask: Well, can you tell me for someone who who you hire and is doing well, what can they expect for a career path in let's say three years or five years? All right. So that way, they they know that you might want to work hard and move up through the company. Uh, you might ask them, where's the growth going to come from in this company? Things like that of a more strategic level is a conversation with you trying to find out if that's a company that's going to be good enough for you, not just are you a good enough candidate for them. And the whole atmosphere changes when you're having a conversation with that interviewer rather than just trying to come up with the right answer. That's my biggest tip I can give you. I completely agree with you, Ken. Um, and I actually even think that last part where you talk about is, are they a good match for you? Um, I always think that's a really great question to ask the hiring manager at the end. Um, I did that personally. Um, I'm really huge on going to conferences and I'm also huge on not necessarily job security because no, I mean, I don't believe anybody can guarantee you job security, but uh, like, you know, culture and, and what's the work-life balance like and things like that. And when I got to the end and she asked me if I had any questions, I, I said, well, okay, well, now that I you know, know that clearly I feel like I'm a good match for your company, I wanna make sure that we're in line and that you're a good match for me. So um, I was really straight out. I said, I really want, I really like to go to conferences for within the industry and keep up to date. Do, does your company support that? Do you provide reimbursement? You know, like, I wanna know if you would be okay with me being active like that uh, during work hours, right? Um, and, I was really huge on learning and I wanted to make sure that they support that and that they provide opportunities and options like that for free. Um, another thing that I had asked was, uh, this was during COVID, right? I literally jumped in right when COVID started and uh, I asked them, how do I know that I can feel comfortable with your company when there's a bunch of research companies right now laying people off? Like, how do I know that I can feel safe with you? Like I was real, straightforward is that I'm making a big jump right now. I need to know uh, that there's things in lines that your company is doing with the, in the culture and all sorts of things that I can feel comfortable and a little bit more secure in making this jump, right? So these really in, you know, specific questions are very important because again, yes, you want a job. Yes, you want to be in the industry, but how would it be if you're not taking these kinds of things seriously for your sake? you know, and you get in this job and you're miserable because you don't like the way that they treat their clientele, you, uh, their, well, their clientele, you don't like the way that they treat their employees, or you don't like what their focus is, right? You're not going to be as engaged and that's not going to help you grow as you're trying to grow in the industry. So you really want to make sure that you're also a fit, right? So I 100% agree with Ken all the way. Um, Monica, Judy, Chris, do y'all have anything that you'd like to add? You, you could also ask some things like, you know, what are the biggest issues you see your company facing over the next couple of years? That's a good or, one. Or uh, can you describe to me a little bit about how you're different than the competition? How do you beat the comp competition in the marketplace? And see what they say. How would you describe the work environment here? You know, an open-ended question. See what they come back with. And then that leads into some of, of Ash's things. Well, do you support people who 
uh, want to get more education, that want to go to conferences, things like that. I wouldn't ask about vacation policies. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when's, my first, when's my first day off? Uh, that kind of thing. What's the bonus structure here? I mean, you know, those kind of things. If you get another callback, then maybe you can chat about the details. <laughs> <laughs> exactly for sure all that uh, another question right they ask uh when can i start talking about money and this and that i'm like okay wait till you get the offer letter and then then you can go from there <laughs> right yeah. but i don't know monica do you, you all have any experiences that you have with interviews um i mean i i have it's been a while since i probably had one that didn't go well but i guess i would have to say um because i know you went through it in detail is showing up to an interview not prepared not prepared knowing the company that you're interviewing about, not prepared knowing about research or anything like any other positions and you just show up and go for an interview and there's, you know, questions you can't answer, you know nothing about it. That already is, you know, a waste of time on both ends. But I would say I've had a few of those interviews that didn't go that great. Um, and that's just my, my, my experience in the past. I would also add a few obvious things, like one, showing up to your interview late. Obviously, that's not a, a good start. Um, also, though you don't control this, um, try and be as likable as you can. If somebody doesn't like you that's interviewing you, they're not hiring you. Um, try and leave. Uh, this is very uh, profound these days, but try and leave pl uh, political conversation, unless, of course, it starts off there out of the conversation. Uh, nobody wants to hear about your views on politics, whether they agree with you or not. Um, these things, uh, it's funny because I've done a lot of interviewing and these things all come up, right? People come up late and I've had people show up two hours late for an interview. It's, what are you doing? You know, you're two hours late, don't even bother coming, <laughs> um, let alone five minutes um, or discuss things that are just not appropriate to the interview. So, and being likable definitely helps. Agree. Um, another thing I would say is that if you're going to be doing a virtual interview, which mostly nowadays is what's happening, please be prepared. Okay. Have, have your setup good. I mean, you see here, like chest to head, you know, screenshot, uh, you know, headshot, you know, making sure that, you know, you have either nothing in the background or decency, the background, right? Where it's not like crazy going on behind you. Uh, you know, have everything prepared. If you have lighting, make sure your microphone's working. I mean, you know, the individuals on the, on the other side of the interview are on a time frame, right? And so, I mean, me personally, I am very meticulous about time. So if I am off by 10 minutes, I'm already getting flustered. So, um, and that's obviously just me, but some people are like that, right? And, and HR and recruitment, they're, they have to time block everything. So, you know, if you want your time to be respected, you need to respect their time and make sure that you have everything ready and again, prepared like everybody said, because if you don't, um, yeah. And again, be presentable, right? Speak up. If you feel nervous or anything like that, then prep, do mock interviews, at least an, a day, two days prior, work on your voice speaking. I mean, if you already know that you're a shy speaker, speak into the camera, record yourself. If you sound very low and you can ask your family to check, like, do I sound really low in my talking? Well, then work on talking higher, right? These things are a serious thing just because you have good answers. If you're, if you're shy or if you're like talking like this or, you know, if you're like this, you know, because there's individuals that will do interviews like that, um, you know, like it's just, it's all over the place, right? So you want to make sure that you have everything prepped and prepared. Um, yeah, I just want to build on, on Ashley's thing right there. A, a com very common question is, tell me about yourself or tell me why you're here today. You need to practice the answer to that and not come off the cuff on that sort of stuff. You've got to, you know, go out and decide where you're going to start. I start in high school. Tell me about yourself. You start in high school. Well, maybe, maybe not. You start with your last job. Know what you're going to say there and be confident about saying that because that for sure somehow or other some form of that question is going to come up. So you better have, I'm not talking about your elevator speech, which might be in the top of your resume. That's also important. Um, you know, somebody might say to you, give me two sentences of why I should hire you. Well, you be ready for that, but be ready for, tell me about yourself. Tell me why you're here. Yeah, most definitely. I've, I've been, uh, I also do mock trial interviews. I've done mock trial interviews where I asked that question and they weren't prepared for it. And you will literally see like within a minute, 
go from answering the question to like really derailing off into mm-hmm. a whole other place because you can see the nervousness, right? And so, yeah, I, I agree. And that is actually a question I always ask because it's, I think it's, it's, you can use that question and answer all the questions that had were going to be coming down the line for you if you answer it really well. At least that's how I feel. Um, and so, yeah, I, I agree 100%. Uh, Judy, Monica, did you have anything you wanted to add in regards to that? No, you guys nail it. <laughs> Ken, uh, people are asking for your, your information. Yeah. <laughs> would like to what? connect with you in LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, Ken Paley, I think it's in there. I'm going to, uh, is it is okay if I share it? Oh, sure. And And my LinkedIn is probably not would not pass Ashley's muster because <laughs> I'm not out there looking for a job or anything else, but I thought That's I better awesome. put a few things in there in case anybody, <laughs> if I can help anybody. I do consulting and I'm mostly on marketing and strategic planning. So I just thought I'd put a few things in there, but I'm not out looking for a job or anything. So you, you get a couple of basics there, but uh, sure. reach out to me and if I can help you, I would. Awesome. Thank, thank you, so you much, very Ken. much for your expertise. Yes, well, my pleasure. Yeah, Ashley. <laughs> Does anybody Very have gorgeous. any other questions? <laughs> Thanks, Monica. Sorry. Does anybody have any questions for the things that we've gone over? I know it's very still very surface. There's each of these sections could really honestly go on maybe for an hour to two hours each. But um, okay, how to fix gaps in resume? Uh, are you talking about work gaps? Um, honestly, I mean, me personally, I think that that's Kind of an area where you can speak about that in the interview but ken i don't know if you have any personal preference according to that yeah make sure that uh if there's a gap in your resume don't try and cover it up with something i mean if i if i see a, a one-year gap in there i'm going to ask about it but it's definitely not a knockout and it could you know i'm pretty flexible on that so maybe you were taking care of a child or a mother or maybe you were ill or you know i'm not going to ask you details on that but if, it, if I get the feeling that you, it's something strange or you're covering it up, I mean, even if you were in jail, I'd rather you told me that than try and cover it up and I find out that that's not the case because we're going to do a background check on you anyway. Be honest. Uh, Honesty is always best. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, you can. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, how, how limited is the honesty level? Uh, when you're in an interview. Um, I know that we want to be likable and we want to be able to um, like present yourself well. But uh, what if on the other end, when you're asking, for example, like, tell me about uh, uh, the work ethics and and, and specific things about the actual company and they may or may not take it very well. Um, so, like how, how do you kind of recover from that? So it depends on how, if, if you were to ask me, tell me about the ethics of your company, I might be a little offended by that. Obviously they're great. But if you ask them, tell me about the working environment here, that's a different question. And that'll open me up to tell you, you know, what it's like there. If you start feeling uncomfortable, remember you're interviewing them too. So if, if all of a sudden, you know, hey, you know, every time we get a chance to, we sock it to the customer, well, that, you know, you're going to find that out. And that's maybe not the type of company you want to work for. But, right. you know, if you say, uh, how many lawsuits have you had in the last three months? I mean, you know, that's <laughs> not going to fit well with me, even if you want right. to know it. How do you treat women in your company? No, I, you know, I don't think that's the right question. Yeah. But you could so find the ways what, to kind of present them. Yeah. So tell, tell me, tell me about your management. Uh, can you tell me what the profile of your management is? Uh, well, what do you mean? Well, I mean, how many women? How many men? Uh, do you what? What is your thoughts on diversity? Those kinds of things you can ask in a nice way, and they're a perfectly legitimate question. But if you say, how many Hispanics you got on the board? I mean, you know, that's going to get my dander up right away and I'm going to you know, get my back up and I'm going to think you're kind of confrontational. You can get the same yeah. information by asking it in a nice way. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, I, I appreciate this. I, we have here a uh, love questions for interviews, interviewees to ask the potential employers. Is there any way we can have them in written form? I tried to write down as many as I could. However, I feel 
We have missed some gems. Well, we have this recorded, so you can always go back and rewatch this again what LICR is here for. We want to provide great content and resources for y'all. It'll be on our website. It'll be there for you to always go back and rewatch. Um, for Tayo, what's your advice for someone who is new in this field and interviewer is asking about previous experience? Uh, me, I think that uh, it's a good way to kind of shift that, not the question, but, you know, the conversation and say, well, you know, um, given my background, uh, I don't have direct clinical research, but my skill set within these previous job experiences were X, Y, Z, and it transmits very well to clinical research, X, Y, Z, in a way that I went ahead and kind of um, emphasizing and showcasing that I'm really, you know, wanting to move forward and, and really trying to, you know, gauge my way into the industry. I'm getting these certs, I'm educating here, I'm being active on LinkedIn, and, and I'm with these organizations, I'm learning and being part of these forums. So if you can talk about all these things and use the same language of the industry, I mean, yes, you don't have experience or exposure, but you're showing initiative because I'm pretty sure most of the previous interviewers, interviewees are not going to be listing all the things that they're active in, the individuals that they're speaking to. Um, I mean, at this point, you could even go as far as if you did your research on the company, you can talk about how you learned about their education and how you really appreciate that because you're trying as a new person in the industry, trying to break through education is really important because you have already done X, Y, Z, right? So you're kind of, yes, you're, uh, you're, how do you say, you're confirming that you don't have a bunch of experience, but you're shifting that into your strengths, right? That you're trying, that you're, you persevere through like these barriers and stuff and you're really trying to to get your foot in so it's redirecting the conversation not so much being it in a negative aspect but you're really bringing it in the positive light so it's again it's the play on words and how you go about selling yourself and everything again that you're doing because if you're not doing all of this clearly this is not going to be this is going to be an issue in the interview right if you're not doing everything you can to get in the industry outside of just getting in the industry through a job um, it's going to be hard to showcase these skills um, and the extra that you're doing. And uh, your job, no matter how great it is or how much senior management you had, I think it's always good, especially if you're from a full, on, full other industry, it's good to also showcase that you're still trying and you're doing everything you can out here on the side. It shows, you know, initiative, right? And it really at the end of research, yes, it's knowing about the information, you're still going to get trained like you came at square, square one, even if you had all this experience, you're going to get trained in the very beginning and it's going to be very thorough, extensive training. And, you know, you're going to be good once you're done with that training. But for you to come in and showcase that you already have all these really good qualities, that, that says something for what you'll be bringing to their company, right? So again, it's a play on words. If you're not good with that, obviously do mock trial interviews go online and try to find ways to answer these questions, right? Because you're going to probably get answered the same type of questions all the way through. Um, it's, how you it's how you answer them. Um, and to kind of add to that, when I interviewed for my CRO, I had two interviews. I had the talent acquisition specialist and the hiring manager. They asked the same questions. That actually threw me off a little bit. I was kind of like, oh, you know, I'm sure they gave each other notes already. I don't know why they're asking me double, but it's because they want to see, I guess, how I can elaborate and how I can give more information. I also, I guess, you know, be more personable. I don't know. So I made sure that I kind of redirected my answers, right? They're the same answers, but I'm trying to shed light a little bit more expanded, right? So again, making sure you, you do what you can to really give yourself some extra cushion which is all this extra things right the certs and all of that good stuff um any other questions i would add one thing to that if i can so a larger company great advice ashley um being that i've hired for smaller companies um i like it when somebody doesn't have experience and they offer to prove themselves the, they're willing to intern for a couple of weeks right uh, really unpaid good. internship um you can promise your potential employer that you feel as though you would be a great fit for the company and I'm willing to prove myself to you with no cost to you, right? If nothing else, at least it shows that you're confident in yourself, right? And the employer may take you up on this. I know I have. So 
um, gives you an opportunity to prove yourself. A larger company surely is not going to do this. Uh, PPD is not going to do this. But, <laughs> yeah. but a smaller company uh, may do this. That's actually Thank a really great one. I've never heard that, that Chris. I rem that actually make me think about uh, an intern that we had in, in Global, that he started sending uh, messages in um, uh, to Dan, uh, like like probably every week, and then and then he said, "I offer uh, my time, uh, volunteering time. Please let me let me show you how good I can be." And he ended up being an employee after. That's after. right. Yep, and it certainly can work that way. Yeah, that's really great. I actually never heard that before. That's that's amazing. That's really awesome. I like that. And how how. I'm so sorry. How much mm. time do you offer this volunteering time, you know, so you don't get taken advantage of, you actually see some kind of progress? <laughs> so I, I think a month is reasonable. Um, and you can gauge your empl potential employer on this as well. If they try and extend this to two, three, four months, maybe this isn't a company you wouldn't want to work for anyhow. And worst case scenario, you gain some experience in the industry. Um, sure. And you can utilize that for a future position. Um, there's always benefit. There's always a silver lining, right? So um, I would say a month is reasonable. Thank two you. weeks, two weeks to six weeks at most. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, and if you you're can even a... add the timing, right? Sorry. Yeah. You can no, even no, no, add no. the time. Like I, I will, uh, I would like to offer my volunteering time from, uh, let's say, uh, June uh, 15 until July uh, 20 or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Or Thank even kind you. of set some sort of like a goal post, right? So if you don't want to do a month and say, okay, how, where can I help out? And, you know, say you need data entry or whatever. Well, how about if I f finish what would probably be two weeks to a month if I can finish it in XYZ time? I mean, you know, obviously trying to give some pretty exceptional uh, success goal posts is probably another good option unless you want to don't want to be overworked or something but um thank you dan and monica that's really great Super chris, awesome. but that's chris, okay I'm sorry dan, I'm <laughs> chris, dan is not here chris sorry chris. Uh, again uh, just to reiterate i would offer a month again you want to give yourself some time to learn the position to learn what you're to be doing and then show that you can do it well i think a month's plenty of time for that awesome awesome well, you guys, we are close to 30 minutes over. Um, so happy that we were able to do this today. Remember, please remember that next Tuesday, the 22nd, Dan will be on here with Lindsay. We will be making that post as well. Please share this with you know, friends, family, anybody that's looking into um, you know, being into uh, clinical research. Um, and we provided our LinkedIn's through the chat. This recording will be provided uh, you know, later on, we'll be posting up on LinkedIn. Please do not forget to subscribe on our, on our website, latinosinclinicalresearch.com. Uh, find us on LinkedIn, Latinos in Clinical Research. Um, and just again, to you know, mention, as we mentioned, Latinos in Clinical Research, there's also the CRC and CRA Academy for those that are wanting more specific guidance within the research industry to come out with a cert. And if you're looking for any like resume, cover letter, LinkedIn or mock trial review or help or any assistance like that, please reach out to me at the AM approach, uh, find me on LinkedIn. Um, and lastly, just so you remember, this will be, the, next week will be the end of our career series, but next month we will be having our tech series. And this is really great because again, Part of what's really good is uh, putting on your resume, knowing that you can showcase that you understand certain technologies, right, within the industry. Um, and we're going to be having some of these tech come and demo their technology. And this is a great opportunity to ask questions, maybe even see if there's opportunities for you to learn and demo it for free, um, all sorts of things like that. And if you could do that, you have that experience, you understand the technology, you can put that on your resume, right? So. If this is something that interests you, please uh, show up and we will be posting and emailing everybody on that. But other than that, that's pretty much everything. I want to say a special thank you to Ken for being here. We really appreciate all your insight. It was really just gem. You're very, very welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. much for being generous with your time too. 
Ken. It's quite <laughs> <right. Absolutely. laughs> Thank you. Awesome. And actually, we think... Ken is going to be in one of our videos soon. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, that's going to cost you. <laughs> <laughs> For the first with... time, no? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. We hope you enjoyed it. We will be seeing you next week. You guys have an amazing week and awesome weekend. Thank you for including thank me. Thank you. For sure. Bye -bye. Thanks, Ken. Everybody, bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.